Hi, welcome to the signal pack. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This unit here is an Agilent N5182A. This is an MXG vector signal generator. Now, even though it only goes up to three gigahertz, it's still a fairly modern and valuable instrument. This has a dual arbitrary waveform generator built into it for vector modulation, of course, and it has very good phase noise. The MXGs have quite a bit better phase noise than the EXGs. And I think I've looked at an EXG before, so you've probably seen a little bit about it, and I've done reviews, and I use these kind of instruments in the lab all the time. This is something that Keysight still sells. Now, there's something wrong with this. We're going to go ahead and turn it on and do a, qu do a couple of quick tests on it to see if we can figure out what's wrong with it. And hopefully, there's some information in the service manual, maybe a block diagram, that would help us debug it. So let's wait for it to boot up, and we'll take a look. Well, the instrument seems to boot just fine. The flickering you see here is only visible on the camera. There's the frame rates are fairly close. And uh, it looks good. I think we should connect it to a spectrum analyzer so we can see how good the output is at various frequencies. This should be able to go from 100 kilohertz all the way up to 3 gigahertz. Okay, so I have the output of the instrument directly connected to the input of the DSA875. And that's going to allow us to make a nice, nice compact measurement here all within the screen. So this is in preset mode. So I'm going to go ahead and disable the output modulation since we don't want to have that path enabled at all. Just look at the RF signal. Let's go into the amplitude, set the amplitude to 0 dBm, and the frequency at 3 GHz is fine. So let's go and enable the output, and what do we have? There you go, that looks pretty good. There is our 3 GHz signal, and this cable really is very bad, and I think it's leaky, because you can see that's actually my microphone coming and going, depending on how I sit. So that's definitely not from the instrument, so ignore that. Uh, these tones must be from the unit. Uh, maybe they shouldn't be there, we'll find out. So far, at 3 GHz, this looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and reduce the frequency, make sure it works. Seems to be okay so far, and the amplitude is correct. So I don't know what's wrong with it. Um, let's go by 100 megahertz. Yeah, it looks good. So what is wrong with it? Why is it listed as problematic? One gigahertz. Wow, it, it does work. Uh, 600 megahertz. Let's go slowly. Maybe there is a dropout at some frequency that I already missed. Oh, no, I take that back. Look at that. Something is seriously wrong with it. And I think it happened at 250 megahertz. Yep, it did. Here's 250. Everything looks good. We go to 249, and it breaks. And he has a huge harmonic here that shouldn't be there. Yep, something is wrong. We can keep going down. 240, 30, 20, 10. Yep, it does this all the way down. And that certainly shouldn't be there. So, yeah, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work, but only doesn't work at below 250 megahertz. Interesting. So another question is why? Well, there's a couple of things we can do. Obviously, we're going to open the unit no matter what, but we should take a look at the block diagram because we should understand where this problem could be coming from. If you look at the signal path, no pun intended, we should be able to find out what happens at 250 megahertz that makes uh, this switch happen. Obviously, something in the architecture changes at 250 megahertz. It could be that they're using different bands and they're mixing different terms. Normally, in synthesizers like this, to generate frequencies below, let's say, very low frequency of 250 megahertz or so, you don't generate that with the internal PLL. You're going to have to do some mixing. So I bet you there's something wrong in one of the mixers. So let's go and take a look at the block diagram. We should be able to find out what's wrong with it. So here's the block diagram of this instrument. Luckily, it's available, but of course, the information is very limited. Now, for such a complicated block diagram from a large instrument like this, it's probably better to start from somewhere that you're familiar with or something that you've measured. I know most of these blocks have seen many of these instruments before, so we can start from anywhere. But since we measured the output, let's go ahead and work our way backwards from the output port over here. So here's the output. I can see it right here. So we can zoom into that area and see what it looks like. So here's the output section. Now, at the very output, we're going to have an electronic attenuator. Interesting that this one does not have an electromechanical one. They must have done a really pretty amazing job getting these attenuators to be in solid state. So if you look at this block, it's probably not the issue because you wouldn't get a narrowband response from an electronic attenuator like this. You wouldn't get it working properly uh, all the way after 250 megahertz. It's too much of a narrowband response problem. It's most likely not from here. So we can ignore that. But I can already see that the output is broken into several bands, which is what I suspected before we look at the block diagram. We have a high band, and the high band seems to support 3 to 6 gigahertz. Now, this high band is not even present in this instrument because this one does not have uh, the 6 gigahertz option, which means this is not even here, so forget this path. At the bottom, we have the 250 megahertz to 3 gigahertz band, and now it immediately becomes clear that the 250 megahertz to 3 gigahertz band is working because we measured it, and it's fine. 
and the output of that we can see comes over here there's a selector switch and then it makes it say to the output so that part is good and the bottom here you can see there is a divider which goes into the ALC detector that power divider with the LAC detector does the leveling of the output and that part is working because otherwise you wouldn't get a leveled output up all the way up to 3 gigahertz which we do but you can see there's a heterodyne band here and this band is exactly the band that seems to be the problem because we don't have anything operating below 250 megahertz that's exactly the job of this band you can see the output of it is set from 100 kilohertz to 250 megahertz so we have to focus our attention into the heterodyne band now there is an output, the output is showing up, which means that most of the stuff is working. Now the reason the noise floor is so high, well it could be several different things. Let's see how that heterodyne band actually works. So looking at it a little bit more carefully, let me zoom in a little bit more. We can see that what we have, let me clear all of these. So what we have here is a 1 GHz signal that comes in with a low pass filter into a mixer. And then we have a 1 GHz to 1.25 GHz signal, which is taken from the low band. You can see that that signal is stolen from the low band with this switch. Goes over here, and you get, that comes over here. It's got some attenuation control up to a mixer. And then afterwards, there is a low-pass filter, two low-pass filters, in fact, to clean all the harmonics out and then give you the 250 MHz output, which also means that the signal must be pretty bad uh, because we still had so many harmonics which means that either the filters are bad which I doubt it because they're most likely passive or something's gone horribly wrong with the mixer so there are several things we can check well first we can check to see if the 1 gigahertz signal is present if the 1 gigahertz signal is not there then the mixer doesn't have an LO now it may be that there is some signal there it's just not strong enough or it may be that it has a horrible harmonic behavior whatever it is is causing an issue the mixer itself could be dead if the mixer is dead, then we are in trouble because we would have to change the mixer completely and I'm fairly certain that that's not going to be a part that's going to be easy to find. It may even be a key site custom part. The other possibility is that 1 GHz to 1.25 GHz is not present. Now, I don't think that's the case because if that was true, then you would get nothing over here at those frequencies. And we know that the circuit works. We know the 250 MHz to 3 GHz path is functional because we get those signals. That means the 1 to 1.25 GHz signal is most likely also present, unless then something has gone wrong with this switch. Now this is a solid state switch. It's unlikely that the solid state switch works on one path but not on the other. That's probably not the issue neither. Now what about over here? Well that's another solid state switch. If that was the problem, you wouldn't be able to select the higher frequency. So you can see with some logical uh, conclusions from what we measured, I would say with fairly high confidence that either the mixer is dead, uh, one of these amplifiers is a problem, or the 1 GHz signal is a problem. Now the 1 GHz signal doesn't come from around here. We have to follow it. I actually don't know where it comes from. Let's follow this line and see where they take that signal from. I have a feeling it must be coming from the synthesizer section because it's a fixed frequency. There you go. It goes all the way to the left. Yeah, I'm not very good with this mouse. Let's see. Ah, there it is. Yeah. Is it the synthesizer? Yeah, it's from the reference board. Here we go. Right here. So now we have to find the reference board. And then the reference board, let's take a look over here and see how it's done. I'm looking at this for the first time myself. Uh, here it is. Okay. So we have a 100 megahertz uh, VCO of some kind or 100 megahertz crystal of some kind. And that signal is coming over here. And I'm assuming these are all connected. It has to be. So that signal comes over here, over here, over here. It gets multiplied by 5, goes out. That's a 500 megahertz vector modulation reference frequency. And then it's tapped off over here, amplified and doubled again, and then low and bandpass filter to 1 gigahertz. And there's a detector here which det detects and levels the 1 gigahertz signal coming out. So there you go. So that makes sense, which means that from the reference board, the 1 gigahertz signal is generated, passed all the way to the heterodyne section, mixed with the 1.25 gigahertz signal to produce 250 megahertz. So the architecture all of a sudden becomes fairly clear. So if I go ahead and do a fit over here, you can see the signal flow completely all the way from here. I think probably can zoom in a little bit more. One more. There we go. There it is. Yeah, so we have our 1 gigahertz signal generated in the reference board going all the way down and across, all the way up here, 
mixing with the signal generated from this section. Now, I, I didn't look at any of this stuff here. The reason because this stuff is probably working, otherwise we wouldn't be getting the regular signals. I also didn't look at anything in the baseband section because we didn't look any, at any of the arbitrary waveform generator functions anyway. And the ALC section is most likely working because we see the leveling, which means that the problem is either in the heterodyne mixer or in the reference one gigahertz generator. There's a doubler here, so we will have to check all of these paths all the way to the output and check the mixer. But the issue is there is no indication where these boards are or they are labeled maybe. I have to take a closer look. I haven't looked inside the instrument. So let's go ahead and open it and see if we can identify these uh, different components on the board, different boards at least, and then we can start uh, troubleshooting. And I went ahead and took the top of, top of the unit off and I had forgotten that the EXG and the MXG series are actually a single board instrument. And I did the full review of the EXG qu quite a few years ago and I've forgotten about that. That's how they've managed to, managed to make it such a short profile. It means that all the blocks that we saw are not individual cards like they are in the older instrument, but they're all on one gigantic PCB. That's going to make things a lot harder because they're not really labeled in any meaningful way. I hope they are on the, on the board. I haven't seen it yet, but I do remember the EXG board being very complicated with a lot of components on it. So let's go ahead and remove the top. I've already gone ahead, taken all these screws out, and I loosened the board a little bit, but there's some cables in the way. So let's get rid of this cable. This is the LCD front panel cable, and this is... I'm not sure what this is. Looks like maybe the USB port or the buttons. Yeah, it's the USB port. Let's go ahead and put that aside and go ahead and remove that. Oh, yep, it's definitely loose. There it is. And oh boy, look at that. There is a lot of components. So we're going to have to be very careful to see how we can reverse engineer at least by function, if not by component. And unfortunately, some of these shields have been left behind. They get they get stuck to the PCB, but once they're stuck on the PCB, you want to put that cover back, you actually have to remove them and slide those on the cover because you cannot, uh, this gets squished and you can even see some of them are squished on this from when they were assembled at the factory. Uh, that's going to be a bit of a problem. And actually looking at this, uh, these guys are the output attenuators most likely. Yes, they are on the reverse power protection is also here. So perhaps these are not fully in solid state. There may be some relays in there, I'm not sure. But anyway, that's not the problem anyway. And then looking over here, you can see this is the entire output section. You can see, remember, by the way, when I did an x-ray of some of these boards in the past, a lot of low pass and band pass and high pass filters are embedded in between the layers of the PCB to save space. You can see one here with bow tie shunts, but that is not. Oh, I think that was Siri talking back to me. So. Um, you can see in this section there's some filters on the board, but um, a lot of them are already internal, which you cannot see. Let's ignore this entire section over here. This is the digital section. There's an Ethernet port and a USB port. Don't have to worry about that. Some power. There's the main bus connector, which goes down onto the other side and into the power supply. This is most likely purely power supply from what I see, because this board doesn't really need to talk to anything else, uh, perhaps maybe only a few places. And then uh, there's another one here. Maybe that's for the data. Most likely this is the data part. Uh, some SanDisk memory here. This is probably the internal memory for the ARB. We have a 10 megahertz oven controlled crystal here. And this is the core of the synthesizer part. So that's, uh, you, we saw this in one of the block diagrams. A bunch of digital stuff over here, most likely part of the PLL. And the outputs, 10 megahertz outputs are here. So that makes sense. It's close to this section. We have a path over here, which looks like a series of amplifiers. Another path over here. A three-path selection. This is most likely for different bands. Uh, in, in the multiplier section, we did not look at this. This is definitely part of the PLL. We, I recognize this component from another instrument that I had repaired in the past. Uh, interesting, we have a PA here. And uh, we have a Xilinx uh, Spartan FPGA glue logic for everything here. Other than that, looks good. So now what do we do? I'm looking at the silk screen, and there's absolutely nothing written on it that I can tell associating these components or subsections to any of the block diagrams. Uh, you can see many selectors, selection switches. These are all solid state selectors. And there's many of them for the different paths. So the main path appears to be this one. That's certainly one of them. This could actually be the main path. Yes, so the signal comes over here, goes over here, then goes through this to the output. There's a separate path here. Interesting, this may actually be one of these two, I would say this one might be the heterodyne path. 
so I'm already thinking in this area so I don't know where the alloy generation is I have to find out where the 1 gigahertz signal comes in there is a doubler somewhere on this board we're going to have to find that there's a times 5 somewhere on this board as well where the 500 megahertz signal is generated we should look for that too yep there's a lot of stuff here so let me see what I can think of to see how we would identify these components so I have some ideas on how to debug this and first let me show you something pretty cool these ceramic packages have LEDs on the inside of the package so they light up which is pretty crazy I've never seen that before so you can see there's a lot of stuff I've turned the unit on there's like, some LEDs and debugging LEDs and so on but there's nothing wrong with them they all show what they're supposed to but I have an idea on how to find what we're looking for I'm going to take an EMC probe and I'm going to go over the board and I'm going to look for various signals that we expect to see I can set the instrument uh, to below 250 megahertz and above 250 megahertz and we can search the board with this probe until we find the different signals we're looking for we're looking for the 1 gigahertz to 1.25 gigahertz signal we're looking for the 1 gigahertz LO signal and the 500 megahertz signal and then we're looking for the mixer because uh, once we find the mixer we find the heterodyne path the only thing I'm worried about is that there is also as many components on the other side of this board which I haven't taken out I know this from the EXG teardown I've done in the past so it could be that the portion we're interested in is not even on top it could be at the bottom and that's what I'm worried about I looked around and I didn't see a mixer and that begins to worry me and if you're thinking this is a mixer here it's not it's actually a transformer I looked it up it is a low frequency transformer so this is definitely part of the heterodyne path and that was a big uh, hint there because of the frequency of operation is less than 600 megahertz so it could be that this section my intuition was that this section is the heterodyne and this section is the RF output but as you know the low band and the heterodyne band interact because we need the 1.25 gigahertz signal so there are some hints we can look for I also found the VCO which is right here underneath the ribbon cable let me reposition the camera so I did find the main VCO and this main VCO is uh, produces from 1 to 1.75 gigahertz signal this VCO looks just like the one from the uh, EXA or the MXA that I repaired in the past so it's the same architecture so I'm beginning to understand the different sections here so what we're going to do is we're going to take the probe I have connected the probe already to the spectrum analyzer and you can see quite a few tones there some of it is from the microphone and just moving it around you can see a lot of tones come and go so I'm gonna have to go closer to the different sections I also had another idea I thought that we would put this instrument into sweep mode and have it sweep let's say from um, 100 megahertz to 300 megahertz and have it continuously sweep so when we look for this we can see which tones move and which tones don't move and that will also hint at where the LO signal and the RF signal is and that's gonna help quite a bit as well so let's set that up and give it a try okay let's give this a try the instrument is up and running and it's sweeping in the low band this is set from DC to 2 gigahertz so the middle is the 1 gigahertz point and I have the peak tracking you can already see the instrument sweeping even though this is just sitting up here so it's not even close to anything that's how much radiation comes off of the board another indication of how important it is for these things to be shielded without the cover this thing is a disaster not only would it not pass any regulation it will have a horrible mixing and anything from the outside will mix right into it this tone that you see here 516 megahertz that's from my wireless microphone unfortunately it's really close to the 500 megahertz we're interested in so we're gonna have to keep our eye out for that one so we know the output works let's take a look yep there it is you can see so let me explain what we're seeing here so that's exactly what I would expect to see here this signal is starting just above a gigahertz and it goes all the way up to about 1.25 that's that's the range in which it has to mix with the one gigahertz tone to create our IF and you know what there it is there's our IF you can actually see it they're, they're sweeping together exactly what you would expect if this is here and this is here it means somewhere on the board there must be some signal at one gigahertz because otherwise you wouldn't be able to mix these two to produce those signals so this is very promising let's go to the output directly there it is you can see very nicely and the output there's our output and even here you can see this being coupled into it so the output is there and, and it was there when we looked at the output directly anyway but what was amazing was that there was a lot of noise which I don't see right now of course because the signals are really weak like this so let's go ahead and look at the output path there it is that's our low band path yep so the intuition was right 
there it is very strong right here so indeed we do have our sweep and that's that's to be expected again because we did see that the instrument does work above 250 megahertz and it uses the same low band path to generate the heterodyne band so this is working it should be working otherwise we wouldn't have anything above so let's go near the transformer and check it out yes indeed the transformer is very close to the IF section so there's something going on there let me search some more what is really crazy is that I don't see the 1 gigahertz tone at all and I don't see the 500 megahertz tone at all so where is it then so look at it okay so there it is there's our PA that's this is definitely oh there it is look at that that is the low band path yep this is the amplifier for the low band so this is the heterodyne amplifier this is the low band amplifier and somewhere there must be a switch maybe around here it's most likely around here yep there you go this goes from this path yeah that's got to be it and there is that's where they couple it I, I see it now okay I see it now so maybe this actually goes this way interesting I have to take a look at these components because this is a perfectly symmetric structure and uh, this du dual path PA so it might be going both ways it could actually be coming this way and amplifying mixing and somehow coupling back in maybe from here oh this does say RF out that's the only thing that says this is RF out yeah I'm just thinking out loud here because I'm, I wanted to you to be part of my thought process here we can hover this over the VCO yep there it is our VCO signal is indeed working I can go over the PLL there should be a lot of tones because it's a fractional N there it is indeed that is expected I can go to the digital part which is going to be absolutely a mess that's to be expected too yeah very fun to play around with this so let's see where is our VCO there, where's our, there it is there's our 100 mega signal let me see where is it strong oh my god that's a strong signal there is our 100 megahertz VCO or uh, oscillator that's we found that so near in here there should be a 500 megahertz signal because there is a times 5 multiplier I don't see that yet not yet that's still 100 megahertz where is the times 5 multiplier oh oh there it is found it here's our 500 megahertz signal it's right here and I think there's a connector on the other side of this board so this is definitely the 500 megahertz signal that's what goes to the other board we follow that we follow it we follow it you can see the 1 gigahertz now starting to appear and oh that disappeared what happened here so here's the 500 megahertz these are the harmonics of the 500 and then we go over here and it disappears hmm maybe the signal is going the other way no that wouldn't make sense because the harmonic gets weaker strange and I'm gonna have to take a close look here so certainly this area is of interest we can already see here's the output of, uh, RF output portion yeah that we see the RF signal so we certainly found it but I can't find the 1 gigahertz signal which is actually kind of consistent with what we would expect to see if the instrument was broken uh, I wish I had a, one of these that was working I do but I don't want to open it completely just to find out that signal so I did some more playing around here and I think I found out the architecture fairly confidently so 500 megahertz is brought into here from somewhere maybe from this path and then it gets split some of it goes onto the other side and some of it comes over here we have a transformer here which converts a single into the differential we go into a four pin package here which is most likely a pair of diodes and that goes from differential to single ended again and that is almost certainly our doubler and that goes over here and then the signal disappears onto the bottom of the board unfortunately this probably means that the mixer is on the other side because I looked around for it for a while and I couldn't find it and this signal disappearing into the board goes somewhere over here and then basically goes all the way behind this and then after that you don't have the LO signal anymore but I did notice something interesting which I'm going to show you again now that we know the signal flow let me zoom in a little bit just so we can have both of these look over here I'm gonna bring this here you can see our 500 megahertz signal very strong and I follow this path I follow I follow and then look as soon as I pass the doubler the signal disappears and I'm I'm sure this is a doubler because it cannot go the other way because you need a differential signal very hard into a pair of diodes to create the second harmonic and then filter it so the signal flow is definitely this way and then we go you can see strong 500 megahertz signal that's what you would want that's how you would get the second harmonic you go past the diode and then nothing yep disappears that 
would explain it. You can see there is a little bit. Second harmonic is still there. But this is very, very promising to be able to find this. If that's the issue, that would explain it. Even if the mixer is on the other side, I would have loved to measure the mixer. If things get really desperate, we would have to take the board out. But the fact that I can work on this, by the way, when the instrument is on, is a huge plus. If you remember when I was repairing the, the EXA, or what was it, the MXA, I forget now, the spectrum analyzer, uh, because these boards were not accessible, I had to solder active um, uh, amplifiers directly onto the board and use an active probe to bring the signal out into spectrum analyzer. So this is so much easier that we can do this and actually see it from the top. Yeah, so I, you know what? I have a feeling it's got to be that because the signal just disappears as soon as I go over the diode. Let me take a closer look at the diode and see if I can find a replacement. I do have a lot of boards lying around, and I'm sure somewhere else I can find this uh, doubler from a different board somewhere. So the patient has been transported to a different table, and this is one of my sacrificial boards that I used in a, in a different repair. I bought this broken, and I took some components from it. And I was looking around, and I remember seeing a doubler on this when I was doing this repair. And indeed, the doubler section is here, and it looks almost identical to that doubler. It makes sense. I mean, it's a very straightforward structure. Let me zoom into this section. And here's the doubler section where I'm going to salvage the diode from. So here's a transformer. By the way, it could have actually been a transformer too, I should say, um, because it's hard to tell. They're so close to each other from that probe. But let's start with a diode, because the transformers typically don't, do, don't go bad so easily. So here's the diode, and I checked, and it has the same marking on it, luckily. And it kind of makes sense again, because these are instruments from the same era. They're doing the same function. So I should be able to take this diode and put it on the other board. And then we can try it again. And the replacement went fairly straightforward. Here's the old one. I broke one of the pins while I was trying to remove it. We could measure this by itself to see if the diodes are actually working. But I already installed this one, so we could just go ahead and turn the instrument on. And I'm going to pass the probe on top and see if we can actually get a 1 gigahertz tone here. That would be a, a huge improvement. It doesn't mean that it's the only problem. Maybe the mixer is bad also, but this would be a start. Okay, I just turned the instrument on. It's not sweeping anymore, but I, either way, I think that 1 gigahertz signal should be there because the 500 megahertz signal is always there. So let's see, is there 500? Let's find that again. Okay, here's our 500 megahertz signal. It's nice and strong. I'm going to go over the doubler. Come on. And where's the doubler? Ah, yes, look at that. That is a nice, strong 1 gigahertz tone now. There you go. It's actually fairly spectrally pure. So yes, it is working. So if I go over here now, I can still can't find the one gigahertz tone. But if I'm maybe closer to this area, definitely the one gigahertz is definitely much, much stronger because I'm using the probe in exactly the same way I was before. Made sure to remember that. Yep, it looks much better. Okay, that's pretty exciting. Okay, let's go ahead and hook up uh, the spectrum analyzer to the output now. All right, let's give it a try. So I have set it to 1 gigahertz and 0 dBm. Let's turn it back on to make sure that path still works. And, uh, hmm. Oh, well, you know what? It would help to connect the output. Jeez, I think I'm rushing. Okay, let's try again. So there is our 1 gigahertz signal. The amplitude is correct. It is 0 dBm. Let's go to the marker. Let me change the amplitude here, because I changed it because of the external PA we were using. There it is. Looks good. Uh, 1 gigahertz, 0 dBm. So it should work all the way in the frequencies it used to work, because we didn't really change anything there. So I should be able to go all the way up to 3 gigahertz and come back. I should have changed this cable. Although now the board is open too, so we do see my microphone even more. Let's go back down, 98765. So up to 250 should be no problem. And yes, it works. Look at that. It does work. It has the correct amplitude. The noise is fixed. It does not say unlevel. Let's go back all the way down to 10 megahertz. Yes, it is beautiful. That's really promising. Look at that. Very happy about that. Let's do a sweep. Okay, let's set the trace to max hold. And let's go ahead and turn the sweep on. And there it is. In the entire band. Looks good. Let's change the amplitude one higher just so we can see the peak better. Yes, look at how flat that is. Perfect.
it looks beautiful. So I think I probably is fixed because most of the other stuff was not in the path anyway. I mean, all we changed was a doubler. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the repair of this instrument. It was certainly a nice thing to play around with. And there's Pooch making sure everything is okay again. And thank you again to all my Patreon supporters. You can go ahead and visit the Patreon page to see my goals and so on so you can be familiar with what kind of stuff I'm trying to do in the future. As always, thanks again to the support. It makes this kind of videos possible. I'll see you next time.